In this video, you are going to discover finite state machines and how and why you'd want to include them in your project. So first of all, let's understand the problem that can be solved using a finite state machine before we get straight into using it. As you can see here, we have this animated character imported to this very basic scene using this code template. We have the model loading code and the camera position it based on its location and also the mixer and a couple of animation actions by the way, if you don't know how model animation works in 3GS, you definitely have to watch this tutorial before you continue with this one. I'll leave you the link to it in the description below. Now, say we want to run a different animation when the mouse button is pushed, then back to the initial walk animation when the mouse button is released. To do that, we are simply going to create the event listener for each event, then play one action and stop the other. And now we have our character walking, then if I click on the scene, it starts running and if I release the mouse button, the walk animation is played again. We can improve this a little bit by adding a fade in and fade out to the animations and that will create smooth transitions between the animations instead of the instant change that happens when the mouse events are detected. To do that, we are going to change our code by adding a few lines to call the reset, fade in and fade out methods. And now the character has transition in animations, they don't look perfect, but we may be able to solve that with another couple lines of code, and that's actually what I want you to focus on, I mean we are increasing the complexity of the code base every time we want to add, fix or improve something. Furthermore, let's say we want to make the character have automatically alternating animations. For instance, let's make it in a way that it works for a certain period of time, then starts running for another one, and then get back to working again, and so on. To do that, we are going to set the walk and run actions as global variables, since we are going to use them in the animate function. Then we'll create a counter variable which value is going to be the decisive factor on which animation should be playing. So, we are going to keep increasing its value, and then if it is between 0 and 3, the walk action is going to be played. If, on the other hand, it is between 3 and 6, the run action is going to be played. Then, if it's equal to 6 or more, it will be reset to 0, and thus the walk animation is going to be played. And now if we take a look at the result, you see that the animation is changing automatically every 2 seconds or so. That said, despite that we successfully implemented the example, notice that the transitions are no longer there. Not only that, but the on mouse click animation example is no longer working. To fix these two issues, we are going to have to add a set of other lines of code and we may need to work on the conditions and that means that we'd need more code and probably more complex or nested conditions and that's actually fine if you're working on such a simple case. However, imagine you have an interactive section on your web app that requires a variety of animations for a set of models or maybe you're working on a browser game with a big amount of interactions between your main character in its environment and also the interactions between the different environment elements. Dealing with that the way we worked on the very basic couple examples we've done is going to be a literal nightmare, since you're going to find yourself in your team dealing with dozens if not hundreds of AVELS blocks that are hard to debug and to document and maintain, and that leads us to the main topic of this video, finite state machines. A state machine is a behavior model, it consists of a finite number of states, and is therefore also called finite state machine. Based on the current state and a given input, the machine performs state transitions and produces outputs. An example of a system that we can describe with a finite state machine is how the human body works when it comes to hunger and energy. 
A person's stomach is empty, hence they have no energy to do any activity. Hence hungry is a state here and is represented with a circle. To be able to do their daily activities and maybe go to the gym, they need to eat a well-balanced meal. Thus full here is the state that they get into after they eat. Eating is called transition, which is the fulfilled condition in order for the person to go from the hungry state to the full state. Then we'll add another transition from full to hungry, which represents the loss of energy because of the activities the person did after they ate. Now we can represent the examples we did earlier this way. We have the walk and run animations as states, and then we have the mouse down and mouse up events as transitions, and two seconds passed as transitions between walk and run. Something important to keep in mind though that a system cannot be in more than one state at a time. So what does this have to do with the code we've implemented earlier, you might be asking. Well, using finite state machines helps tremendously to solve the problems I've talked about earlier, and that by separating the wide variety of states of your game elements from the main logic, not to mention the very well organized way to set the states which makes the logic behind the process of handling the different interactions so easy to understand. Now back to our project, let's undo all the code we've typed and we'll also get rid of the global variables including the mixer since we'll not need them anymore. That done, now to set a finite state machine for our astronaut, we need to install an AI library called Yuka. Having said that, if you don't have any experience with the library, you have to pause the current video and watch this one. So to install it, I'll type the following command in the command line, npm install Yuka. Then we'll import it in our code. Now we'll create an instance of the Entity Manager, which you must know what it does if you've watched the tutorial I've told you about. Next we are going to comment out this line, since we don't want the animations in a separate variable, but we are going to re-inject it into the model itself. The next step we are going to do is create a map variable, if you don't know what is a map, I highly recommend you watch this video. For the sake of the simplicity of this tutorial, you can think of a map as a simple object literal that we get and set its properties with the get and set accessor methods. Now we'll create three animation actions for the examples that we are going to implement in the next section, and we'll call play on the three of them. In addition to that, we'll set the enabled property of every action to false and I think you can already assume the role of the property from the key in its value. We actually deactivate the actions because we'll leave that to the finite state machine to handle. Next, we'll add these actions to the map. That done, now we'll create an instance of the Astro class and pass the mixer in the map as arguments to the constructor. The Astro class here is just a custom class that we are going to create in a moment. That said, we'll add this instance to the entity manager and set the import code of the class in the path to its file before we continue with the code that updates the entity manager. Now we'll create our astro file and import game entity from Yuka, which our astro class is going to inherit. By the way, I have a couple of tutorials on OOP JavaScript and imports and exports in case something doesn't seem totally clear. Then we'll set the constructor method and the couple of new class properties, and we'll create the update method in which we are going to update the animation mixer as we're no longer doing it from within the animate function in the main file. Next, we'll return the current object and export the class. 
So up until now we're still doing only the preparation for the finite state machine, but we still didn't create it yet. Having said that, let's create a GS file and call it states and import the state class. And as you may have guessed from the import and the GS file name, this is where we are going to set the states of our finite state machine. So first we'll create three constants, each containing the key of each action we set into our map so we can select them depending on the state we are working on. Then to create a state we'll simply make a class that extends the state class and we'll make three methods. The enter method is an entry action that is executed right before we enter this state. The execute method represents what should happen when we are in this state and what transition should take place when a certain condition is met. Exit is an exit action that is executed right after we leave this state. In our case since we are using the finite state machine for animation, we'll use the entry action to fade in the animation, so we'll simply select which action from the map using the get accessor. Then we'll reset the animation in chain call fade in and pass the duration of the fade in. And here we can just pass a value or we can for example set a property to the astro class that specifies this number so we can use it multiple times in the same in the other states as well. We'll leave execute empty here to achieve a couple examples in the next section and we'll use the exit action to do an animation fade out pretty much the same way we did with the entry action. And now we are going to replicate this a couple times to create the walk and run states. That done, our three states are ready to be used. So we'll go back to the astro file and import the state machine class to create our state machine and also import the three states that we've just created. To set a state machine to this class we are simply going to set the state machine property and assign a new state machine instance to it. Next we are going to call add to inject the three states into this state machine. Then we'll need to set an initial state by calling the change to method which takes the identifier of the state we want the agent to be in. And the final step of this long preparation process is to call update in the update method which will keep the state machine listening to any occurring change so it changes its current state to another one depending on the input. And that's it for this section. Now let's redo the first example using the finite state machine. One way to do that is by creating a property that indicates if a mouse button is pushed or not. And then we'll create our event listeners and change the value of that property. Next in our states file we are going to set a condition that changes the current state to the other one based on the value of that property. So if a mouse down event is detected the current state is going to change to run whether we are in the idle or walk state. On the other hand we'll change the state to idle within the run state if the mouse up event is detected.
As you can see now, things make a lot more sense and the code base is clean and organized. The second example we are going to make is the alternating change of the animations. And here we'll start with the creation of a couple variables. So basically we are going to make it in a way that the character walks if it has low energy and vice versa. That said, since we are talking about something that increases and decreases over time, we will need a variable which value depends on the time and that's why we have this delta time variable. Now back to the states file, idle means rest, hence the character's energy should increase over time and that's what we are doing with this line. And then a change of state should take place based on the value of the energy. And we'll do the opposite when the character is walking because obviously walking means decrease of energy and once it hits zero it can no longer walk, hence go back to the idle state. And this is it for this tutorial, so make sure to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next video.